Folks, here we are in our last week of introduction to New Testament Greek. You made it. I remember many months ago, the end of September 2019, when I held up the textbook and said, you're going to be carrying this with you everywhere you go for the next six months. And when you're done with it, I promise you, you're going to be able to read a little bit of the original New Testament um, on your own with the help of a glossary or a dictionary, but you're going to be able to work through New Testament Greek by yourself. And I think at this point, you can do that. So we've worked really hard. You've done really well. Um, everyone's passing, which is not that normal in a university uh, Koine Greek class, but you're very determined and we had a lot of fun and here you are in your last week of content um, <clears throat> getting ready for your take-home translation exam. So here, how far have we made it in Jeremy Duff um, Elements of New Testament Greek? By the end of, by your next quiz, we will have made it to the end of chapter 16, which is the perfect. Uh, so we did not do the subjunctive. And so that is something that you will, it's the one thing I regret that we, we didn't cover. And basically the rest of the textbook, uh, there's a chapter called Final Pieces, there's a chapter called Extra Verbs, but basically subjunctive, subjunctive is the only um, remaining important bit of your textbook. So if anyone is going to go on next year or the year following to do Intermediate Greek, your teacher, Peter Watts, will be aware that you didn't make it to the subjunctive, which is quite normal in my time at Nottingham. No one's actually made it to chapter 17. You guys have made it as far as anyone else ever has. And so Peter Watts will help you through the subjunctive before you launch into translation from the ancient primary text, which is what the intermediate level does. And for some of you, I do hope you go on to that because I think you would love it. Um, this class, I'm probably going to hold some optional sessions where we can just dive into the New Testament in Greek together for fun. So you can just basically to prove to you you can do it now. But for now, to the task at hand. This is the video on chapter 16 of Duff, on which you will have a quiz. And so I've given you some slides that go through the chapter in a different way from the textbook. So with the combination of the slides and the textbook, working on your own, you should be able to get a handle in the perfect. It's not that complicated. You've come through middle and passive voices last week. You've come through participles. So perfect is going to be just the icing on the cake compared to the hard stuff you've been through. It's not that difficult. One thing I want to say in this video though, in really basic terms is, what is the perfect? Like what does it even mean in English? So going through the tenses, You've got present, imperfect, aorist, future under your belt already. And now you're basically learning a new tense, the perfect. And um, let's just throw in the pluperfect as well, even though it's really rare. For completion's sake, perfect and pluperfect. What do these mean in English? Present means, well, since I have a glass of wine here to toast when we get to the end of this video. Let's use the verb to drink. Pino. Um, present. I drink or I am drinking. Imperfect. How would you put drink in the imperfect? Give you a little minute. Ding, 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 time's up. So imperfect is an action that's ongoing in the past. So not I drank, but 
I was drinking. And then we have aorist. We're talking the indicative. So we're just talking our basic tense right now, the indicative. Present, I drink, I am drinking. Imperfect, I was drinking. Aorist, I drank. I drank, it's a one-off in the past. Um, future, I will drink. And then we get to perfect. And perfect means, oh, I spilled my wine. <laughs> uh, I haven't even had a drink yet. Perfect is an action that happened in the past, but the state is still valid. And pluperfect means an action that happened in the past, but the state is no longer valid. So perfect in English would be something like, I have drunk. And pluperfect would be, I had drunk. I wonder if drink is the right verb to use for this. So, to make it more clear, let's think about breaking a window. So, if you walked into the room and I said, I have broken the window, would you assume that the window was still broken? I have broken the window. Answer, yes. That's what the perfect means. You're talking about something that happened in the past, but the result is in the present. I have broken the window means it's still broken. But if you walked into the room and you saw the window with like a, a big crack on it, but like a piece of tape over it, and I said, I had broken the window, I'd be implying, but I fixed it, so it's okay now. So I have broken the window is the perfect and it means it's still broken. I had broken the window is the plu perfect and it means it happened in the past and it had a consequence and now the consequence is finished. That's really, really rare in, in Greek. What else can I say about the perfect? Um, the fun thing about the perfect and plu perfect is that the way you form them is basically to stutter the first part of the stem, to stutter or stammer the first part of the stem. So if the verb is luo, then the stem is lu, you add on the beginning of lu the first letter once again, plus the vowel, epsilon. So it's le lu. So if the stem is lu, you re it's called reduplication. You reduplicate the first letter of the stem with a le. Lulu. It's almost like you're stammering or stuttering. Um, where would you find this in your textbook? It would be on page, well, 179 has the form of the perfect. So, um, can you see? I wonder if you can see. Maybe. So here's the perfect in the active and the middle and the passive because now you've got all three voices so you need to know how to be able to say things in the active and the middle and the passive so see what's going on there the beginning of the stem is getting repeated with an epsilon isn't that something so and then there are these endings for the indicative. Leluka, lelukas, leluken, lelukamen, lelukata, lelukasin is the active. For the middle, we'll take a deponent, which is a, um, in the middle form, we'll take ruamai, rua which we've always been using as our main kind of example of the middle endings and the deponent. So the stem is ruamai, so ru. So you take the first letter of the stem, ro, you add an epsilon, eh, so the stem becomes re ru. So re rumai, re rusai, re rutai, re rumatha, re rustha, re runtai. And then for the passive, 
here we go again, back to Luo. Lelumai, Lelusai, Lelutai, Lelumitha, Lelustha, Leluntai. So you, you've seen these endings before. And there's also a perfect participle. Were you able to see that on the chart? At the bottom, those are the participles. Um, this is for the indicative. For the other moods, you don't have to worry about the perfect. Because remember, um, remember the other moods only have aorist and present tenses. And in the other moods, uh, aorist doesn't mean past. It means sort of undefined or default. And uh, present doesn't mean uh, happening now, but it means um, continuous process. Or for participles, um, eris doesn't mean past, it means happening in sequence with the main verb, and present doesn't mean happening now, it just means happening simultaneously with the main verb. Um, so you don't have to worry about perfect for the other moods. You only have to worry about perfect for, well, the perfect participle and for um, the indicative. What else can I tell you from the chapter? Um, if you need, to, if you needed to boil down the perfect into one essence, according to Duff, that essence would be the, the concept of completion. So the perfect um, implies completion uh, in the past. When it comes to translating the perfect in comparison with translating the aorist in the indicative, it's not always obvious how to make them be different in English translation. It's another example of how English translation of Koine Greek is not perfect. And it does help if you're being very analytical about the New Testament texts or ancient Greek texts. You can't rely on a translation into any language, including English, to really give you the sense in all cases. And the perfect is one of them. I mean, how can you tell the difference between the perfect and the aorist? I have untied or I untied. The meaning is sometimes lost in English. We often, in English, we're kind of losing the, the perfect and plute perfect. Many people don't use them any anymore. They just use the straight kind of past tense. So English is losing nuance, and that makes it even more important to learn the the Greek if you want to really catch the nuance. Um, what does it say here? I didn't plan this video. I'm just I, I poured a glass of wine and I decided to just chat with you about the perfect. Um, the idea of the perfect. The perfect tense is the fifth and final tense that we need to learn. The essence of the perfect is the idea of completion. This is an aspect rather than a time. It conveys the nature of the action. If the perfect is used, it is not a process, present, nor is it undefined, aorist, but rather it shows the action is now completed. Time is not so important in the perfect. The fact that the action is completed says something about the past, because it was done in the past, but it also says something about the present, that it is now completed. If you wanted to find a slogan to explain the perfect, you could say it's a past event with present effect. Past event with present effect. Um, some examples. Oh. I know what I need to mention. This is in the slides too, and obviously in the textbook. Stem changes. So, because you have reduplication with the perfect, so you have repeating the first letter of the stem and adding a little epsilon to almost make a little stutter. So the stem is redoubled or reduplicated. It, it makes it very easy to recognize the perfect if you see a doubling, but the exact form that the reduplication takes, just like with many other cases we've dealt with this year, kind of depends on the, the letter combinations. 
So normally the consonant is repeated and it's followed by an epsilon. Like lu luo becomes leluka. But what if the stem has an H sound in it? So that would be a chi, which is like transliterated CH, or a phi, which is transliterated PH, or a theta, which is transliterated TH. If the stem begins with chi, phi, or theta, the consonant is repeated, but the H part is not. So what, how would you make a chi without the H? I'll let you think about that. How would you reduplicate a chi without reduplicating the H? Ding, 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 it would be a kappa. It would be a kappa. So the reduplication, the, the verb stem starts with chi, but the reduplication beginning part would start with kappa. What would you do if it were a phi? The stem starts with a phi, so that is a ph. How do you reduplicate it without the h? I'll let you think about it. Ding, 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 time's up, it would be a pi. What if it were a theta? Ding, 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 time's up, it would be a tau. So the th gets reduplicated without the h, so it's just a t, if that makes sense. So basically, just think of it this way. An H can't reduplicate. So there is there is no stem beginning with H, really. Um, but there are stems that imply an H, like theta, phi, and chi. And so when they reduplicate, they lose the H because it just cannot reduplicate. What if the stem starts with a vowel, you might ask? The doubling of the vowel is done by lengthening it. So if a if a verb starts with a if the stem starts with a vowel. Um, you can't I mean say it started with epsilon. You couldn't reduplicate it by repeating the epsilon and then adding an epsilon. That would be like eh 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 eh. So instead of repeating the vowel, it lengthens. So what would in I mean the lengthening uh, rules or something we learned quite early on. So if it started with an alpha, it would lengthen into an eta. If it started with an epsilon, it would also lengthen into an eta. And if it started with an omicron, it would lengthen into an omega. Omicron, omega. Um, so yes, there are some stem changes to look out for with reduplication. And that kind of thing is why I said you, you can't just not take a Greek class and just go translate the New Testament with a dictionary. Because how, how do you look up a word that starts with eta only because it's reduplicated epsilon? Like that word starts with epsilon and that's where you have to look in the dictionary, but you don't know that if you don't understand all these rules about well, um, you know, conjugating verbs in ways that change how they begin. Whereas in English, uh, we know till you see the beginning of a word, you can look it up in alphabetical order in the dictionary. But in Greek, the beginning of the word is not necessarily the way, um, beginning of the stem. So here's another example of why you actually have to take a Greek class to even know how to look things up in the dictionary. I'm going to stop rambling on. And I'm going to get you guys to email me if you have other questions about the perfect. But mostly, the slides, the slides I made for the perfect should be really clear. And your textbook is really clear. And it's a pretty short chapter. So for your quiz, what do I need you to know? I need you to know the endings. Because there's going to be short translations. Like mini translations. Kind of like the ones not in the A section, but in the... Halfway practice, very short translations, just to practice endings and knowing how to translate the perfect. 
I'm going to need you to know the vocab. This is our last uh, vocab you have to memorize. It's not an open book quiz, by the way. Uh, what else? I, I basically just need you to know the essence of the perfect. Like, what is the perfect? It's an action that happened in the past. Um, and the consequences are still happening in the present. I have broken the window. I have drunk a whole bottle of wine in one sitting. That's not true. Um, so quiz, we're going to join together for a group video quiz um, on the perfect. And it's going to be your last chapter that we're going to do together of tough. And But we're still going to do stuff together because I'm going to give you lots of revision stuff and we're going to have some kind of end of year party virtually and I have a couple of surprises up my sleeve and we need to get together definitely and work through some New Testament texts to prove to you you can do it now. So without further ado, my prop here, which I've already spilled onto the clean laundry, a toast. I am proposing a celebratory toast to all 16 members of Introduction to Biblical Greek in 2019-2020 at the University of Nottingham. A success. A, may your exam be a raging success. And may you keep up your Greek. And may you remember your Greek. And thank you for being such a fun class. It was a blast teaching you. And uh, here's to you and your great success. Congratulations. You've made it. Bye for now.